Hello, Blog Blogging Heads Nation. This is Heather Hurlbert from the National Security Network with Michael Anton from Keep America Safe. And we have been um, we have been planning this Blogging Heads for almost a week, and we are just so grateful to the governments of Turkey, Brazil, and Iran for giving us something timely to talk about. Yeah, yeah. So what happened? Just as a, a, a brief recap. Um, Last fall, the Obama administration uh, had proposed, with with a number of other nations, had proposed a deal with Iran that Iran would ship out of the country uh, uh, roughly two-thirds of its stockpile of enriched uranium. In return, it would receive from the international community uh, some fuel rods that it could use. These would not be necessarily power-generated fuel rods. These are meant for a different reactor. They're enriched to a fairly high level, about 20%, and the idea is you run this low megawatted reactor, but it produces all kinds of isotopes that can be used in medical applications, et cetera. And which is a, this is the justification that Iran has used all along for enriching its uranium past the 3% level, which is really all you need to do to generate electricity. Uh, Iran rejected the deal. It seemed to go nowhere. Out of the blue, um, the, over the past seven days or so at the NPT conference, which is going on as we speak in New York, the NPT being the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty, a treaty that goes back to the late 60s. Uh, every five years, there's a conference where nations get together to review ways to change the treaty. The treaty actually never gets changed as a result of these conferences, but the conferences take place anyway. Uh, anyway, it's going on right now for the whole month of May up in New York at the UN headquarters. Um, Turkey and Brazil floated essentially the same deal with Iran, you know, but in, rather than uh, ship the fuel to Russia, which is what was going to happen according to the original proposal, the fuel will go to Turkey. And the Iranians said last night they have accepted. Uh, it puts a whole new wrinkle in everything, and um, that's the deal that we're talking about. Those are basically the facts. Unless I left anything out, Heather, you can fill it in. Well, actually, the fascinating thing that happened just as I was shutting my computer down is that um, uh, Secretary Clinton announced this morning uh, that we have agreement among the Perm 5 on a sanctions resolution on Iran, and they are going to go ahead and introduce it this week, which is an interesting kind of piece of the, the U.S. answer to, to this deal. So maybe, Mike, I'll pick up the story where you stopped, which is... so. This looks like a really interesting piece of jiu-jitsu um, where the Iranians come back and say, well, see, now we're going to give you what you want so you have no excuse to sanction us. Except, of course, that two things have happened. One is that after the deal collapsed last fall, the Iranians then announced um, something which, you know, quite frankly, probably had been going on beforehand. Um, and after they were, they were busted for it, announced plans to do more and to speed up their enriching of uh, uranium above the, the energy producing threshold so that they now have quite a bit more enriched uranium than they did when the deal was, was right. cut last fall. But the terms of the deal weren't updated in the negotiating that Turkey and Brazil did so that where before... Iran had to remove so much material that there wouldn't have been enough left to make a bomb. Now, with the same amount being removed, um, experts believe they would still have more or less enough for one device, which, you know, changes um, changes the sort of changes the meaning of of the deal. And then the second piece is that that this when this deal was first put on the table um, last year. It was not by itself presented as, okay, this is the solution to the problem of, of Iran and, and nuclear weapons. This is a confidence-building deal that was intended to, to get both sides back to the negotiating table and set the stage for a more comprehensive um, regime that included in, in sort of restarting IAEA inspections and making comprehensive a regime that would really give assurances about all of Iran's facilities, not just not just some of the materials. But over the past um, six months, with everything else having been off the table, Turkey and Brazil and other countries that are, are not so interested in the sanctions regime have are, are now this de- with this deal taking center stage. There is a certain number of countries saying, "Okay, well, this obviates the need for sanctions." Where in fact, this isn't the issue that sanctions were were primarily intended to to address. So it puts it puts the U.S. in an, in an interesting situation. And the good news is that the Europeans and Russia have joined the U.S., or actually even before the U.S. spoke out really strongly saying, this isn't acceptable, this isn't sufficient, there will have to be more. 
Um, but it does it does create a very a very delicate balance where you want to you want to hold on to the international momentum toward sanctions that you've created without the US appearing to be the intransigent party the trick is here and i'm actually mildly optimistic about this because of the disarray within iran and how toxic this issue is but the trick is to to try to get the deal to fall apart from the inside of iran as it in fact did last time where um the Iranian government actually was criticized both from its left and from its right for doing a deal with the West. So I think, you know, that you noticed the first response out of Washington was, well, this has to be vetted by the IAEA, which sounds kind of bureaucratic, but actually that's what caused the deal to fall apart in Iran last time. So, you know, clearly the hope is that if, if in fact it ends up being the Iranians who walk away from this, it actually will strengthen the U.S. hand by, you know, frankly, to some extent saying to Turkey and Brazil, okay, all right, guys, you had your try. Now, please fall back in line with the Security Council. I'm no surprise, much less sanguine than you are about it, but I, I, um, I agree with a lot of what you said. I think one of the mo- most important things you said is just the, the short phrase, with the West, because I think one of the things that's appealing to Tehran about this deal is it's not a deal with the West. It's a deal with two countries on the periphery uh, who are much less sympathetic to the Western American uh, Perm 5 effort to sanction Iran, assuming you, you, you believe that all five members of the Perm 5 are, are dead serious about sanctions, which I really don't. Um, and the IAEA wrinkle that you talk about could be a problem. I think the Iranians, one of the reasons they're much more willing to um, ship into Turkey rather than Russia is, I think they they trust uh, the Erdogan government a lot more than they trust Medvedev and Putin. They share a border with Turkey. They probably have some belief that... Um, it would be difficult for outsiders to really know exactly what's going on, how the transfer is taking place. So the devil will be in the details as to how this gets verified and what uh, level of uh, access inspectors have and all that. And that may end up sinking the deal. I tend to doubt it. I mean, I think that they agreed to this for a reason, and the reason being that it makes the U.S. look foolish and it, amount, it will amount to a, a significant delay to any effort to really get Iran to stop. Notice they didn't say they were going to stop enriching. They're going to keep on enriching, um, which is a, a big question. If all they're interested in is power generation and even the medical isotopes, all that all that material goes into the reactors can be bought far less cheaply than it costs. I mean, far less cheaply, like a small fraction, than what it costs to build the incredible infrastructure that Iran is building to make all this fuel itself. The Iranian rationale for that has always been that the fuel cycle is essentially a matter of national pride and national sovereignty, yeah. and nobody has a right to tell any country, you know, much less Iran, that they can't do it. But it, it, it really doesn't make economic sense to build your own, to make your own fuel, to build the infrastructure to make your own fuel um, if all you want to do is generate power and all you want to do is generate medical isotopes. And other countries uh, who, who really only want to generate power and make medical isotopes don't do it, and that, that's the primary reason why I and a lot of other people believe that that's not genuinely what Iran's up to. The deal allows them to keep the, the centrifuges running at Natanz, keep whatever is happening at Cone, which we don't really know, ha- let, allow that to, it allows that to keep happening. It allows the program to basically go on unabated. They lose, as you noted, the same amount of material that they were going to lose or ship out last fall, except that whereas last fall that amounted to two-thirds or more of the stockpile, now it's half or less. Um, and, again, they keep, they keep running the centrifuges, the essential problem with the program, which is that they are enriching more and more uranium to higher and higher levels, is not addressed by this. I, I was you know, sort of surprised to see the Russians come out and say that they didn't um, see this deal as in any way changing their calculation about sanctions on the one hand. But on the other hand, given that the Russians were sort of guaranteed never to support any sanctions with real bite, probably makes sense for them to you know to play along in, in a way, knowing, as, as they full well know, that... Um, the, the United States was going to continue along trying to get a resolution anyway. And and also the Russians, as they often can do when it comes to issues like this, might be able to just hide behind China and say, well, you know, we can let the Chinese either sink this one with a veto or if not veto it, let them water it down to the point where it has no teeth and therefore we have no real reason to oppose it. Well, the interesting thing, you know, about the Russians, sort of working backward through your points, is is that um, the Iranians have been very frustrated with the Russians. And so there's there's an interesting way that, 
if the, the Turks move in and supplant Russia here, as, as you noted, that there's actually a way that that leaves the Russians high and dry. Um, the Russian, Russian commercial interests have started to be more and more disadvantaged within Iran in the, in the last years. And there's a way that Russia is ending up more and more on the side of the West and the rest of the, the Perm Five, not entirely because it's choosing to, but because the Iranians have sort of gotten fed up with them on commercial as well as um, as well as diplomatic levels. So so I, I think actually the, the Russian scene is a little bit of Russia's own own making, which actually is, is going to play out to the, Although, to the very U.S. Quickly, advantage. If Russia wanted to repair relations with Iran just like that, they could by uh, moving ahead with the S-300 surface-to-air missile sales that the Iranians desperately want, that they think are under contract, that the Russians have been slow-rolling them on for, right. for, for months. And they could move ahead, as they say they're going to do, by fueling the Bushir nuclear power plant, which the Russians have been slow-rolling the Iranians on for yes. decades. And they say, well, it was finally really honest to God going to happen you know, this summer. Uh, you know, I doubt it, just because it's never happened, so I wonder. But, again, if they... They wanted to kind of make it up to them and say, oh, gee, we're worried that Iran is, is moving out of our orbit. we got to get them back. That's, those are two steps they could take. Yep, but it's interesting that they have chosen they have chosen not to do so. I wouldn't ever advocate being sort of naive and saying, oh, you know, the Russians have had a conversion moment and will now line up with the Germans and the French. I, I, don't, I don't see that. But I also don't see that there's – if there were an easy flip, I think – <coughs> excuse me, it would – already have happened. So, you know, I think a second point that's kind of interesting about this is, so, you know, clearly a preferable world for the U.S. would have been one where the Turks and the Brazilians said, oh, my God, you're right, you just can't deal with this government, let us get on board with you on sanctions. But given that for reasons that seem to have as much to do with domestic calculations in those countries um, as anything else, that isn't what happened. Um, There's a way that the, the trick for the U.S., is to gather whatever benefit we can gather from this and lose as little momentum as as we can while, you know, creating every opportunity for the Iranians to miss an opportunity, which is a very kind of challenging diplomatic game to play, and especially with the, the U.S. politics of this issue being what it is, because, you know, you don't want the U.S. to come out and say, oh, no, this is a terrible idea, because then that just gives the Turks and the Brazilians the excuse to say, oh, you see, now you're the problem. Um, but from a well, domestic perspective, anyway. you, know, you look at this deal and you say, well, this is not so great. So so the American, sort of the chattering classes like you and me, are waiting you know, and pushing for the assessment of, well, this deal doesn't solve our problems. But if you, if you operated in a vacuum without sort of a free press and a chattering class in the United States, what you'd want is to be able to say, sure, yeah, Ron, we'll go right ahead. We'll take you up on that offer and we'll see you back at the negotiating table. And, oh, by the way... Um, you know, you're not sure that we don't have the Chinese on board for sanctions, so you should think hard about that. Uh, well, it would be hard for us, for the Obama administration especially, to say anything negative about the deal since it's not really much different from what they proposed last fall. Um, I think the more consistent position, which is my position, even though I realize it's not your position, which is what Henry Sikulski wrote overnight last night, is to say the deal was bad last fall, it's a bad deal now. Um, he wouldn't have proposed it. I wouldn't have proposed it, precisely because it doesn't solve the underlying problem. The Iranians will still operate centrifuges, will still be enriching, uh, will still be adding to their stockpile, and will still be marching toward a nuclear weapon. And to the extent that this entire effort takes pressure off um, the justification and the realization that we need real sanctions, it's a bad idea. I'm not that... I mean, like I said, I was slightly surprised that the Russians say that they're still on board for, with a new resolution, but I also don't expect that resolution to have any teeth or any impact. So in the end, I think the deal is a net loss for those of us who oppose a nuclear Iran and will buy them time, and that's essentially why they do it. That's why, they, why they're why they for it. And two other things about it worry me, and that is what it says about Brazil and Turkey. Um, those two countries, for, for, for slightly different reasons, are supposed to be quote-unquote good guys in, in, in this struggle. Brazil, because it's one of uh, a small handful of countries, I believe it's three, aside from former SSRs, which had you know former Soviet nuclear weapons on their own soil. It's one of a very few countries that had a nuclear weapons program that gave it up voluntarily. So they're supposed to be uh, a poster child for um, uh, you know, good behavior uh, when it comes to proliferation. And for them to sweep in and essentially tacitly wink-wink endorse what the Iranians were doing, I think was troubling. The second is... Um, 
Turkey is supposed to be our sort of secular bedrock ally in the Muslim world, NATO member, aspiring member of the EU, and also when people talk about a nuclear Iran, one of the things that they say they fear the most is that if Iran goes nuclear, lots of other countries in the region are going to have to follow suit, Turkey being among them as the, the largest military power in the region. Well, the problem with that is the Erdogan government over the past year at least has been saying very conciliatory things about the Iran's nuclear ambitions. It doesn't seem all that concerned about it. So this idea that um, we need to worry about Iran the Iranian bomb's effects on the region seems to be undercut by Ankara's insouciance about it. And Turkey joining up with this deal and proposing this deal and being the recipient of the HU essentially amounts to, as far as I can tell, an endorsement of the Iranian nuclear program and a, and a, and a strong a statement that they're not that concerned about it as as could be made. So, you know, you have to back up to what I think the key point of disagreement w between us is because of that sort of explains kind of neatly most of our differences in emphasis coming out of there. So the, the key question is, is really how, what is the route by which you can make Iran, you can render Iran's um, desire to to show that it has the national power to have a nuclear program if it wants one. What's the route by which you can render that desire not dangerous to us and to our friends and allies in the region? Um, and the only route by which you can do that is international. There is no unilateral U.S. route that solves the problem with Iran. And so once you acknowledge that you you can't go it alone, then you are sort of stuck in this challenging mix of different countries, different interpretations, different desires, different views. But there is no way, there's no way out of that. Once you, once you acknowledge that you don't have a unilateral solution to Iran, then you have to deal with Turkey and you have to deal with the Turks' interpretation of the situation, whatever it is and whether you like it or not. And then once you, once you deal, once you realize with that, that you're sort of stuck with the UN as a forum for dealing with it because that's where you can get, you have any purchase on the Russians and Chinese, then you are stuck with Brazil. So once you acknowledge that the, the route, the route to any successful pressure on Iran um, is, is a, an international one, then you sort of have to play the hand you're dealt and the countries you're dealt. And yes, it's really frustrating that the Brazilians and the Turks have decided that the route to showcase the, the route to showcase the, the strength of middle powers is to push back on the U.S., um, but that's not, something, that's not something that we can actually do anything about except by becoming less powerful, which I, I think is, is an option that neither one of us is especially interested in. Um, so then you say, okay, well, what's the way, given that we can't stop the Brazilians and the Turks from, from going out on these little freelancing deals if they want to, um, What's the effective way of dealing with it? And actually, you know, this is a lemon. I, I'm not, I don't think there's, I don't, I'm not interested in saying, oh, this is a great, fabulous development. Um, and I agree that it's not central to the problem that we face with Iran. But um, I also think that any way that you can enmesh Iran more in a system of rules and consequences, which either it keeps, and then you learn more about its behavior and you have more points of access, or it doesn't keep, and then you have more countries bought into the idea that Iran's not willing to play by the rules. So since this is the situation that we've been handed, you play it up as much as you can, and you say, that's great, let's get the IAEA back in there to work with this. Oh. Um, and at the same time, by the way, let's let's now start talking about the other, other piece of this. So, so I think... You know, the, if you believe that there's a unilateral solution to, to the Iran problem, then you can say, oh, this is a terrible agreement and we should try to kill it. But once you acknowledge that there isn't a unilateral solution and, frankly, that there isn't a purely military solution, then you've kind of got to kind of work, as Donald Rumsfeld might have said, you've got to work with the international community you have and not the international community you wish you had. Well, I found two things to disagree with in what you just said. One is... Um, uh, I don't accept the fact that we have to go through the UN. I think Sarkozy and some others uh, who traditionally would, would insist that, the U, that we go through the UN and that the U.S. is out of line for suggesting we not go through the UN has, in fact, uh, there's been some role reversal. It's the United States uh, right now who's saying we have to do everything through the UN, and it's some of our allies who are saying, look, we can't get a real resolution through the UN. Every, anything we get is going to be weak, so let's do it without the UN. Sarkozy has brought up... Um, 
going after imports of refined fuel and talking about uh, but, but Sarkozy well, has no idea. He doesn't have an answer for how to get the Russians and Chinese on board. He, no, and no. As long I, as the Chi- and as long as the Chinese can do, to you the know, contrary, are willing to keep his answer the is oil. they won't come on board. But that we don't precisely because they won't come on board. We got to do it without them, and we don't need them necessarily to at least try to cut off imports of refined gasoline and refined kerosene into Iran. Maybe it won't be a you know a completely watertight ban, but it could do serious damage to the Iranian economy and really get Tehran to think twice. Well, I mean, and this brings up the whole question of whether refined petroleum sanctions are really the best instrument you can it's just, use. It's one example, though. I mean, it's yeah, one well, example of something you can't well, get through no, the but UN. No, it's an important. It's an important point because if you believe that refined petroleum sanctions will have at least as strong an effect on the Iranian citizenry, um, who you're not trying to hurt and alienate, as they will on the Iranian leadership, and that they might actually um, reinforce the strength of the Revolutionary Guard. Um, which is something I think we all agree we don't want to do, then you, you, you really have to ask yourself whether sort of weakly enforced, non-universally kept refined petroleum sanctions might not actually be the worst of all possible worlds in that they they hurt the Iranian people, they strengthen the Revolutionary Guard, but they don't um, they don't deal a, a really crippling, they deal a mildly crippling rather than a really crippling blow, and they give they give the Iranian government the excuse to crack down even more on its citizenry and say, see what the well, West is doing to you. I don't think they need any excuse from us. I think they'll, they'll do it when they, they'll crack down when they think it's in their interests, and they'll ease up when they think it's in their interests, and they'll use whatever excuse is at hand. Um, there's no question that sanctions, to the extent that they're effective, they have an impact on a country's economy, which means it has an impact on the population. Um, my point is, you know, if, if we don't want to resort to military action, which nobody wants to do, uh, and if we don't want Iran to get a bomb, which I think nobody wants, uh, and Iran is continuing on the path as things are, which seems to be the case, we got to start thinking about trying other things, and trying those other things may have some drawbacks. They may not work. They may actually make things worse, but what we know right now is the path we're on is a path that ends in an Iranian bomb, and that brings me to my second disagreement with what you had said earlier. You said we're, you know, we're, we're testing Iran, essentially. We're seeing if they comply, and if they don't, we'll have a stronger hand. I think... I mean, haven't we tested them enough over the past 10 years? We've, we've learned how they behave. They cheat, they get caught, they lie, they eventually concede 10%, they concede 20% when they're forced to, et cetera, and the pattern keeps repeating itself. Now we're setting ourselves, we're setting up yet another deal, which they can either, uh, they can sort of start with sham compliance, maybe cheat on, in the meanwhile, continue doing all the things that they've been doing that we're most concerned about, I don't see how this will teach us anything that we don't already know about the Iranian pattern of behavior. So petroleum sanctions also don't change anything about the Iranian pattern of behavior, and they disempower the people within Iran, the alternative power centers within Iran, who, you know, have who have been willing to consider coming to a deal that would involve real safeguards or even reversal of the Iranian nuclear program in the past. So, so the problem is, given that, I mean, I think. The, the, all discussions on Iran should really start with an agreement across the ideological divide that all options are crummy, that there are no good options, and you know basically if you think there are good options, that should sort of discredit you from seriously participating in the discussion, um, regardless of your, your ideological bent. But of the set of crummy options that we have, um, do you want crummy? I mean, you just said you know we should try some things even if we don't think they'll work. Well, if you, I'm not convinced they won't work. You're convinced they won't work. I'm saying maybe, and I think maybe is better than. What we're doing now, which is pretty much, I'm, I am convinced, it's not going to work. Well, except I think, you know, the thing that's been lost in all of this is why were, when it was so anathema in Iranian politics six months ago to accept the agreement with the U.S., why were they, are they so eager to embrace it now? Because it's, it's, because, not an, because, it's, being... because it's not an agreement with the U.S., point one, because it's an agreement with two friendly powers who are doing this as a way to... Um, and partly, not entirely, partly as a way to stick it to the U.S. and to the West. Number And number three, because they're way ahead of where they were in the past uh, in terms of enrichment, so the deal costs them less. And uh, number four, because they see this as an opportune moment to buy time and ease off the pressure which had been building through the spring for another resolution, even though I don't think that resolution would have been particularly strong or hurt them. Clearly, they they think that it's, it's worth trying to avoid and trying to let some of the steam out of the valve. 
Right. So, so the situation this is, changed. This and last they, point is exactly my point, that what you want to do is keep... And it, I mean, frankly, if we could build up the pressure to the point where the Turks and the Brazilians could negotiate a serious regime that involved full resumption of IAEA safeguards and full control of all the fuel, then that would be great, and they could poke the United States as much as they wanted if, if we could provoke, promote... If, if that were the final result and the way we got there was by the U.S. being obnoxious and other countries saying we've got to come in and do this, then great. I have no problem with that. We can... We can, you know, the Turks and the Brazilians can poke us all day long if they get to a, a good agreement. And the way, but the way to get there is to keep enough of a pressure coalition together and to, as I said, at least keep the Iranians worried about the Chinese. You know, we may, you're, you're probably right that we will never get the Chinese on sanctions that would satisfy you. We may or may not get them on no, sanctions, sanctions that would, that would satisfy actually, you. that would actually make Tehran think, this hurts. Maybe we ought to think twice. I don't think the Chinese will ever agree to that because for a number of Right, but clearly we are succeeding in getting Tehran to worry. And what I want is more things. Whereas when when you know we're fighting with the Europeans or the Russians or the Chinese, Tehran's not worrying. That's that's what makes Tehran sort of more relaxed and more able to attend, as you said, to the business of, of um, repressing its own citizens. On the on the IAEA point, I, I I would agree, except I would raise one point, which is maybe I disagree. That I would still wonder. Okay, what are they doing that the IAEA isn't seeing? And the IAEA under current leadership is a lot better than under old leadership, and I'm sure they'd be more thorough and more willing to confront the Iranians and more willing to tell uh, U.S. and other intelligence services what they know, etc. But it's a big country, and countries have very successfully hidden nuclear programs or parts of nuclear programs from the IAEA in the past. And I, my first thought, if Tehran said, all right, we're going to agree to safeguards, inspections, everybody can come back in, my first thought would be, all right, why are you agreeing to this? It means that you're confident you've got some other piece of the puzzle completely hidden <laughs> that you feel you can, you can safely go ahead and let them look at this other stuff. You know, Mike, there is sometimes a, sus- a suspicion among people of my pol- political persuasion that there is, in fact, nothing that the Iranians or any international adversary we have could do that would satisfy you, and that was a great... Um, that is, that is why people on the left get get so anxious about you guys from time to time. Well, yeah, how many times you, have we caught them cheating and uh, caught them cheating? Discovered a new site that they hadn't disclosed. It's it's you know it's several. Uh, I can think of four off the top of my head. And right. and yet I, they don't have a weapon. I mean, I don't I don't want to be sanguine about this. I don't want to du- say it's that all I'm in that direction. And that right. does seem to be the point. Well, what's you know the other sort of fundamental thing that I think we disagree on, and I don't think there's agreement within the Iranian political elite on this point, is are the Iranians really hell bent on getting a bomb and either using it and or sort of wielding it, or are they hell bent on making sure that we all know that they could get a bomb any time they wanted, and wh- which one of those two it is is actually critically important. And it may very well be that that hangs in the balance between segments of the Iranian political elite. And, you know, this is the conversation that is very difficult to have in the U.S., but in many ways it's it's one of the most important conversations we can be having internationally. How do we, how do we make sure that whether or not um, we have a faction in government, as to be quite honest, we probably always will, even if the Green Movement were to come to power tomorrow, that says um, it's Iranian, it's Iran's sovereign right to be able to build a bomb if we want to. How do we make sure that never tips over to um, it's Iran's best decision to build ten or twenty bombs and have them all pointing at Tel Aviv? Well, uh, first of all, if the Green Movement, I, I, I agree, or at least I, you know, I, I, I have to admit it's high, highly possible, maybe even probable, that the Green Movement or any other uh, regime that might replace the, 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 the Islamic Republic would be just as interested or almost as interested in, in being nuclear and, you know, it doesn't exactly solve the problem. However, it lessens the problem considerably yes. because the Green mm-hmm. Movement or some other regime would not be the, you know, committed to an, an, an Islamic radical ideology and the export of terrorism. They're still number one on the state sponsored terror, terrorism mm-hmm. list and have been since 1983 or 1984. So I'd worry, you know, I wouldn't be entirely, you know, comfortable with it, but I'd worry about it a lot less. Um, second, I think another place where we disagree is and I'm sure you know a lot more about the inner workings of the Iranian regime than I do. Um, I will, I'll say that up front. But I don't put as much confidence in internal political jockeying and who's up and who's down because it seems to me from the outside that 
on major issues of major importance, it's what the supreme leader wants that, that happens. The elite jockeying doesn't matter that much. If the supreme leader and the supreme leadership has wanted a nuclear weapon now for years, if they want a nuclear weapon, that will be the policy, no matter who's the president, no matter who's up and who's down inside the you know the, the, the Kremlinology aspects of trying to follow what's going on inside of Tehran. And the last thing I would say is. Um, I don't think there's a huge difference between, as you put it, wielding the bomb and getting right up to the edge, but maybe not building until the last seconds. Obviously, there's a big difference between using, which was the first thing you said, and wielding. But if the point of having a weapon or a nuclear program that would allow you to build a weapon in a very short amount of time is to threaten your neighbors and to build a, a shield behind which the country can up its um, involvement in sending IAD IEDs and stuff into Iraq and Afghanistan to kill American soldiers, uh, up its support for Hezbollah and Hamas, you know, ship more rockets into Lebanon, that kind of thing. Uh, those amount to, it, it amounts to essentially the same thing. If all the countries who would want to be taking action against Iran, they're going to be pretty close to just as deterred by uh, an Iran that can wield a nuclear weapon as they would by an Iran that hasn't demonstrated that it has a nuclear weapon yet, but everybody knows could do it in uh, a couple of weeks or a month. Well, I, I mean, I was actually more the difference between, say, 20 minutes and, and 20 months or even two months is pretty extraordinary in terms of the options for response that you have. So it, I would, I would it, disagree with you. It matters in terms of the, sta- the specific standoff with the Israelis. If you, and I, I wrote about this in a piece yeah. a while ago that, you know, one of the things that troubles me the most about an Iranian bomb is uh, a nuclear standoff between Iran and Israel when launch times are so short that you know that they even make the Cold War launch times look like an eternity. I agree. It matters when it comes to that. But we would probably, you and I would probably also agree that Iran- in actual Iranian use, while neither of us could rule it out, I probably you know would be less willing to rule it out than you would, is less likely than the sort of, the, the, the use as a shield behind which to uh, increase Iran- Iran's intimidation of its neighbors and its export of terror. Well, in, although the, that place case, that I, the place that I disagree with that is that the Iranians seem to feel pretty comfortable um, whipping their export of terror up and down as, as it suits their political ends right, right now. Wouldn't they be more comfortable if they had a nuclear weapon and, and, and could be confident that all of a sudden lots of retaliatory options from their adversaries were off the table? So I want to I want to back up just for a second before I forget because um, it is, and I I, th- I was glad you mentioned Kremlinology because this is this is kind of a permanent disagreement between liberals and conservatives about whether internal regime dynamics do or don't matter and one of the actually fa- and I I will also disclaim that I am no expert on Iranian politics but I do I do spend a bunch of time with close colleagues who are. Um, we have a, a wonderful collaboration with the folks over at Inside Iran who have done really interesting work at trying to explain for American audiences. And, and one of the interesting things is, I mean, a scary thing, too, is that, frankly, the Supreme Leader is now being outflanked on the right by these Revolutionary Guard folks. And there's actually plenty of evidence of instances where, again, elements within the Iranian military or security establishments, maybe is a better way of putting it, actually wanted to do more and go faster um, both on the terrorism side and on the nuclear side, and where they seem to be being, to some extent, reined in by the Supreme Leader, which is an uncomfortable and, and worrisome situation for for the U.S. I mean, given how little we understand of that, how impenetrable it is to us, and how, um, and this is the real limitation of my argument, how little influence we have we have over it. And so, you know, the, the sort of the natural comeback to my argument, and I'm just going to make your point for you here, is it's all very well to know about all these internal dynamics, but our ability to influence them is still still pretty damn limited. But it's, it's, it's not, it's just, I mean, in a way, if Iran were a monolith, we would actually have an easier time um, because Iran is just able enough to sort of put out this more complex picture about itself to, to, to pull in the, the Turkeys and the Brazils and, you know, in the past, the, the Europeans. And if I think if Iran were as monolithic as, as some conservative analysts in the U.S. tend to suggest, we actually would have had a lot easier time dealing with the Europeans. I'm not so much suggesting that it's monolithic. I, I'm suggesting that um, when it comes to the, the most important vital matters of state, that the supreme leader keeps a tight grip. And that all all sorts of levels, I, I'm I'm not, I wouldn't say well aware, but I'm aware that it, all sorts of levels of domestic politics and very important internal dynamics and things. Poli- there there's a real political jockeying going on inside Iran, and 
domestic policy is made and unmade all the time at those levels, but when it comes to big things involving international relations, Iran's relationship with its neighbors, how it's dealing with the U.S., what it does about its nuclear program, that um, internal politics don't play nearly that much of a role in it. It, it, it well, really, it really is run from the top. That's how the deal fell apart last September, actually, is that it, it seemed to have been sort of cooked up and vetted in one part of the Iranian security establishment and then was brought home and was sort of savagely assaulted, both by the Green movement, which is a little bit discomforting for the Western supporters of the Green movement, and by conservatives, and at that point it was they, they was, was when they walked away from it. So just, you know, that this is... This is a dynamic that makes this situation, and that we don't know, frankly, or at least um, sort of those of us who read the unclassified material don't know it. I'm not sure that... No, no, the people who read the classified that's material don't know it either. We can be right. sure of that. Yeah, that, yeah that's... Okay, with that, we have bipartisan agreement on. <laughs> um, that we don't know how tight a grip the Supreme... And I think one of the scary things is, I don't, I'm, it's not, it may well be the case that the Supreme leadership is no longer confident how tight a grip they have on the Revolutionary Guard. I mean, if you remember... What is it now? Two years ago, that weird incident with the hostage taking of the British sailors, yeah. and there were very strong indications that one arm of the government had done that without the approval of other arms of the government, which is just not the kind of thing you like to see in a state that's that's um, messing around with nuclear weapons. But it also it makes either a negotiation based process or a coercion based process much more difficult. I think it was longer than two years ago, but maybe I know. It's yeah, longer. right. We. I think I was. I, I mark. I mark all time by how long I've been in this job, and, and it's it's a little over two years. But um, actually, there, the other thing is there have been multiple such incidents, so we may be okay. we may be thinking of different ones. So should we move on to new start? It has been submitted yeah. to the Senate, mm-hmm. and I read this morning that a committee hearing. Actually, I think not just it the is, hearing. It is but underway. A committee hearing is underway, even as we are speaking. The vote has been scheduled for June. I forgot the exact day. The committee which, vote, yeah. The committee vote, right, which is surprising to me, and I'm sure it's discomforting for a lot of Republicans who uh, would like to keep this process going as long as they possibly can, and I expect them to complain about being rushed to consider uh, this important treaty and the hundreds of pages of annexes, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, what has surprised me so far is I, I sense a lot of conservative and Republican opposition to the treaty, and yet... I've heard no senatorial voices that I know of come out and flatly say, I can't vote for this. Um, I've heard a number of pundits come out and say, you shouldn't vote for it. Um, it's, it, it. It's not quite clear to me where it's going or what will happen, except that I think if, if they do end up voting for it, because, again, treaty needs 67 votes, uh, presumably Scott Brown will be uh, on the Republican side on this, which means you will have, if we go by Kyle's, famous letter that he put together that he engineered last December, you'll have uh, 41 Republicans plus Lieberman all, not exactly holding out for a no vote, but if they they take what they said in the letter seriously, holding out for significant uh, concessions on the administration side for modernization, which is to say doing something beyond what we currently do to make sure that the stockpile is reliable, secure, and will actually work. And there's quite a bit of Democratic and liberal opposition to that because the things that the conservatives and the Republicans want to be done, Democrats and liberals say amounts to building new nuclear weapons, which they don't want to do. Um, If they hold true, if the Republicans hold true, I think that will that will be the price uh, for the Obama administration of getting enough votes on the treaty. But that will put the Republicans in another difficult position, which is the treaty does contain constraints on missile defense. Now the administration says they're not important constraints. We can quibble about how important they really are. So let's let's stop they and are talk about modernization. Though. Let's talk okay. about modernization first, and then move on to missile defense. So I actually, the Republicans are already in the the difficult situation that you describe by virtue of the administration's having um, submitted a budget with a thirteen percent increase for modernization, in which Linton Brooks, who who ran the uh, who ran that part of the complex in the Bush administration has said in public that he would quote have killed unquote for even, a budget even, like that. Even better, I saw this more. Even better, if you're a Republican or if you're the administration trying to outflank the Republicans, I saw this morning that their 10-year proposal for the nuclear weapons complex uh, is now 80 billion. Yeah, which is so, pretty so serious. Said, the, yeah. 
the administration has basically sort of decided to decided to 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 buy this one off in advance, and I think that that combined with um, you know there may be a groundswell of of conservative pundits who are outraged about the treaty, but actually public support for it is is you know at two thirds. There's just no sort of opposition to it is going to catch fire in the news climate that we've got right now with so much else going on. So you know you've it puts the it puts the Republican Party in a very challenging situation. And I think the thing about that letter, uh, which you referred to, that was so artful about it, is that, as you said, it leaves it leaves an out for anyone who wants to to say, okay, the money going to the modernization complex buys me off, and I'm now happy to vote for I'm the king. I'm not sure it does leave an out. The, the, the language in the in the bullets is very specific. It says, it, it, you know, it, I forgot exactly what it says. I wish I remembered it. I wish I had memorized it. But it doesn't really leave an out. It, it really, it, whatever... They would have to do RRW. They wouldn't have to call it the Reliable Replacement Warhead, RRW being a shorthand for a canceled program that the Bush administration had thought of, which was trying to you know, design new warheads along old designs using existing materials. The letter is actually very specific. I think it would be hard for anybody who signed the letter to say, well, the money makes it all worthwhile, if they don't spend the money on uh, specific categories of modernization that the letter called for. Well, the thing is, the letter was actually built on an on a on an error, um, or an error is maybe a generous word for it. But the letter claimed that um, language in the appropriations legislation that had already been passed said something about RRW, which it doesn't actually say. So you um, you know, it's a it's a construct, and the the really interesting political question is what are um, 20 of those 41 folks going to decide is is more in their in their interest. Is it really going to be worth um, opposing? Is it really going to be worth opposing this treaty? Or in the end, are sort of well, actually they only need nine. Um, sorry, you're right. I was <laughs> doing the math. <laughs> right. So, but that actually, uh, your correction of my math actually, I think, makes my point yeah, for yeah, me because sure it's, it's going to be easy enough to release nine of them to go along, which which I think is what will happen, whether it happens, you know, in July, um, which in a way you might as well just get it off the table and move on, or whether there's enough of a rear guard action mounted to hold it over to November. I agree. There won't be any um, in this media climate. You know, there won't be any press or uh, a real popular movement to kill the treaty. I'm not sure that's necessary, though. I mean, I don't recall any uh, media firestorm around the Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty when it was defeated. Uh, And (laughs) that is, I don't recall any before it was defeated. There was a big one after it was defeated, and the Republicans nonetheless managed to to sink that one. But I I think the the second pickle that the Republicans find themselves in is over missile defense. And the treaty contains constraints. We can argue that they're not significant, but they I don't think it's disputable that they are constraints. And the Republicans have laid down a marker on that, and I think also just given the party's long-standing support for missile defense, and it's been a, a terrific um, vote getter for them and a great fundraising uh, um, issue for them, and I think they genuinely believe in it. I think it, it, it would be hard. It would be hard for me if I were a Republican senator to vote for a treaty that constrained missile defense and to vote essentially for what I consider to be Russian. Mendacity that our very limited missile defense systems that we have designed and tried to employ over the last 20 years has any chance of defeating even one one hundredth of the Russian arsenal, which they know full well is not true, and yet they always complain about everything we do on missile defense anyway. Well, what's what's so funny about this is that this is really a box that Republicans have totally constructed for themselves, and it's it's a very funny position for a liberal to be in, but it's not a bad position. So first of all, um, the Obama administration has actually, whether you like this or not, kept pretty much intact the arc of increased spending on missile defense, that they have eliminated some of the programs that most egregiously didn't work, and but have actually put more money into to, into diff- other programs. So, so as a, you know, that in fact, as I think you noted, you've got a substantial proportion of, of um, liberals who are saying, hey, wait a minute, but we actually don't, you know, we'd like missile defense to be constrained. So, so point one is as a, as a progressive, you first sort of look at Republicans and say, but wait, man, we're spending all this money on missile defense. What's your problem? Second, um, you know, given that, what the administration did was go and, and talk to the military and say, okay, these are the things we want to do on missile defense. Let's make sure the treaty doesn't constrain any of these. And for what the administration has put forward as its sort of ongoing plan on missile defense, 
the treaty doesn't constrain any of them. It constrains things that the Pentagon has decided it doesn't want to do. So, so that's point two. You know, are you are you saying that you don't like the Pentagon's missile? Um, missile defense plans? Are, are you saying no, you no, no? I don't. I don't think that's. I don't that? think that's entirely accurate. It's. Con- I, it is constraining things that we have already done. So the Pentagon has wanted to do them in the past. But basically, it, it constrains the reuse of existing launchers that were built for intercontinental ballistic missiles or submarine launched ballistic missiles. Taking those launchers, converting them for use as uh, right. launchers. It constrains for, choosing to convert any more to add to the ones right. we already have, which the Pentagon has said it doesn't want to add to the ones we already have. The Pentagon. It doesn't. It doesn't constrain our using the ones we already have. It and hasn't said it doesn't want the to. It's, if they wanted it's, to build it's more, said that we don't have any don't. plans to because right now our eggs are in other baskets. However, the, the ruling out the the conversions could be a problem if we had no other option. But you know, in, in a crisis situation or in a changing environment, we needed to amp up our capabilities quickly, and we're simply not allowed to use existing launchers that we might otherwise have used if it weren't for this treaty. That arguably okay, so is... So I'm going to say something very unliberal here. If we were in such a crisis situation that we had no option but to use those launchers, we would use those launchers. I mean, if we were in such a crisis situation as that, we would withdraw from the treaty and use those launchers. Let's, you know, who are we kidding? Well, withdraw from the treaty uh, is a, brings me to the second point, which I think is, is more problematic for the treaty than... Than the, than the specific constraint, which is the preamble language and what the Russians have said about the preamble language. And this is what has a lot of Republicans very upset. First of all, the idea that the, the, the preamble language explicitly links offensive forces to defensive forces, which has never been done in earlier treaties before. It's something the Russians have been pushing for for a long, long time. They've always hated our missile defense programs, and they hate them because it's something that they really don't do nearly as well as we do. Uh, and don't want to have to spend the money on. But they also hate it, I think, because, again, our, our system, we made a political decision. We, the United States, made a political decision a long time ago that there was a brief moment when Reagan first proposed the Strategic Defense Initiative and Edward Teller was talking about brilliant pebbles, et cetera, that the idea was we're going to try to defeat a launch of hundreds of warheads or thousands of warheads at once. And that was abandoned pretty quickly as being technologically infeasible and very expensive. Now, some people still say it's technologically feasible, but in any event, without going into that argument, we just haven't been looking into it as a nation for a long, long time. What we have instead been trying to develop are systems that could defeat one or two or five or so missiles, the kind of thing you might see happen from North Korea or in Iran. Russians complain about that, and they say it affects their strategic posture, even though under the treaty the Russians will be able to maintain 700 launchers with 1,550 warheads. There's no way any actual or contemplated U.S. missile defense system could deal with that kind of force, and the Russians know it. So why do they complain about it? I think they complain about it because they've spent a lot of time arming, uh, helping to arm countries that are hostile to our interests, and to the extent that we can defend against those arms, it, it reduces their return on their investment. So well, they don't want us, they don't want us to see us to be able to Russian defend. Def- if you were a Russian defense planner, you would be remiss in your duties if you didn't consider in the back of your mind that maybe we had actually managed to to develop brilliant pebbles and had just kept it secret all these years. Now, you and I happen to be pretty damn confident that's not the case. I'm pretty sure. Yeah. But, yeah, I, I being, uh, being, I think, more of a missile defense skeptic than you, I feel extremely confident about that. But if I were a Russian defense planner, that would certainly be part of my planning. Second... Well, why would that... Well, even so, why would you specifically object to something like the um, Polish and Czech sites, which would have nothing to do with brilliant pebbles at all and nothing and, and no capability to stop even, like I say, a hundred, one one-hundredth of the Russian arsenal. Because you have no reason to assume... I mean, look, this is... I mean, and our, our guys do the same thing. We just maybe are less um, public and defensive about it. But you always... Your war gaming proceeds from a worst-case scenario. And if you're the Russians and you know, as you said, that your technology is by and large less advanced and your stuff is by and large less reliable and less survivable than ours is, then anything which looks like it might be a breakthrough... Um, is more in need of being constrained. And the point about the Polish and Czech sites was always that because the Russian posture, um, warning, nuclear wonk alert, um, because the Russian, Russian posture and our posture are not symmetrical, as, as you, I know, know. And the Russians are so much more dependent on the tactical weapons, which um, would be much more deterrable and defeatable by close-in anti-missile sites. 
Um, Maybe that, a handful of them, but they have something like, according to the Federation of American Scientists, the Russians maintain 5,400, and about 2,000 of those are deployed. I mean, those right, sites in Eastern Europe couldn't have That's a handful have more than they've got going against us. So, look, I mean, the, well, you know, back, to the, back to the bigger... When you have a quiver filled with 2,000 of them deployed, you know, if, if 10 of them get knocked out, I, I just, I don't see that as, as all, that, all that significant, even if I'm a Russian military player. Um, you know, for decades, I mean, you can go back through the whole history of arms control, and it's, it's, if you're a military planner, it's your job to see even small things as significant, and it's our luxury as armchair people sitting here to say, oh, shot, they just knock out 10, that's not that big I don't know, Occam's razor to me suggests that Russia, I mean, Russia's been aiding diplomatically and militarily and economically Iran for a long time, and not and not as much as they could, but much more than we would like them to. They must be doing that for a reason, and part of the reason must be... I, I, actually, I, I, I saved the clip somewhere. I, I, a wonderful moment of candor when somebody uh, from the Kremlin said, um, yes, we know that... Um, that's anonymous, of course. I don't know who it was. It was anonymous. This horseman said, you know, yes, we know, of course, that uh, a nuclear Iran would actually cause us a whole lot of problems in our own neighborhood, but the fact is anything that, anything that gives Washington such a headache has to be worth doing. Right, so thought, you, just, you just answered your own question. Um, our missile defense gives them a headache, therefore it's worth trying to stop anyway. It gives them a headache because it, it, I think they know it is intended to defend against Iran, and they don't want us to be defended against Iran because, it, like I said, it, it, it decreases the return on their investment in Iran. But that sort of doesn't make any difference to us. We should decide how we are best defended against Iran and I do agree. that. And we should, and then but we, we should make sure. But we didn't in that case, in my opinion. We, we we did it as a conciliatory gesture to the Russians. We canceled those sites, and no, we didn't we get any conciliation. No, we canceled those sites because the, the, they were built on technology that didn't work, and we switched to technology that we thinks work better. Although, if you look at the piece in the Times this morning, based on some stuff that was written up in um, by the Arms Control Association, you know, there's there are quest there's still questions no, about all well, these systems, and, and I can't, you know, the li- the liberal in me. Just just can't resist mentioning that, you know, I mean, hell, the liberal in me, the scientist in me who likes to look at data and test results, you know, that nobody should think that missile defense in its current form is a panacea for anything. Not a, I, no one's suggesting it's a panacea for anything. It's, it's something that has succeeded in lots of tests. It's failed in some tests, but it's, it's worth pursuing. It should be pursued, especially, uh, especially given the missile threat that continues to emanate out of North Korea and Iran and a nuclear threat out of North Korea and a potential nuclear threat out of Iran. And my understanding of why we canceled the sites well, it had less to do with technology and more to do with siting. That the, the administration made this argument: well, we're going to come up with better sites. We're going to move it down closer to Iran, somewhere in the in the uh, in the Eastern Med. And then the whispers was maybe Turkey, maybe Greece. I mean, that strikes me as kind of close to preposterous, given the state of those two countries today and our relations with them. They're not going to accept anything like that. Well, so, the Turks yeah. actually, the Turks and the Romanians have accepted them, in addition to the, the, the basings in the in the Eastern Med. But just to, to circle back to the New START Treaty for, for a the second. The Turks have accepted a new U.S. missile defense site on their soil to replace the Eastern Europe? If, that, if so, I missed it, and i got to look that up. Um, it's been, I mean, the, the discussions about this have been public in the media for a while no, now without shrieks, anguished shrieks of no, never from the Turks. So, and I think this is where, you know, back to Turkey, you have sort of Erdogan doing political things at one level, and then the Turkish military doing things at another level, and each sort of performing a pretty carefully choreographed ballet around the others. But that's that's probably a whole nother, another dialogue. But the point that I wanted to make about, about New Start is this. So you have... Um, Republicans have tied themselves into a big knot on missile defense because, as you said, it's it's a, it's dear to the Republican heart. It's beloved of of the base, but ultimately, and because they believe that it's worth doing for its own sake, that it will help protect America. I mean, I don't right. want to discount that there's some genuine <laughs> conviction behind it as well. Okay, so, I would even so move that to number one. I will no, I will grant you your genuine conviction, but people are going to look and see. Okay, we have this large and growing missile defense program, which is fully permitted under the terms of the treaty. So, what's the problem? And ultimately, explaining explaining themselves away from that is going to be pretty challenging for Republicans. And you have, you know, where I think we. Funnily enough, we agree on the, the political piece. The interesting, well, you know, the the question is going to be: Is it really worth? Yeah. Um, is it really worth taking a stand against, you know, not just against a president, but against an entire national security establishment, uh, yeah, including be... Republicans? You know, lots of Republicans like Schlesinger and, you know, Baker and all who are testifying this week. Is it really worth lining up against them? You're probably right. In the end, they will c- conclude that it won't be. 
I think, but only if they they have they get something on modernization that they can hold up as a price paid by the administration to get their votes. Well, you know, if I mean, if if you guys can't take it, if you can't say yes to a thirteen percent increase, well, in like I said, it's not budget, the, the money. What you could say yes it, to. The, the, there will be. An, I think this is fair to say that the money is nice, but it also depends on what the money is spent on. And if the money is spent simply on more life extension, sort of more of the same, more of what we've already been doing that doesn't address the root concerns about the aging of the stockpile. I mean, Gates himself, before uh, President Bush left office and before he was asked to stay on, went way out on a limb in October of 2008 and said, we're either going to have to resume testing, which is something I think I would, I think it's safe to say there's pretty close to no political appetite for in either party. Or we're going to have to design and build a new warhead. And the, administ- the new administration, which kept him on, opposes the new warhead. And I, I think every indication I've seen shows that Gates uh, has not given up on that. He stopped speaking out on it publicly, but he uh, continues to fight the fight for it behind the scenes. And I don't think he, he and others, and, and if you read carefully what, what the... Uh, uh, what was said at the briefing after the treaty and after the nuclear posture review came out by the head of the National Nuclear Security Administration and by the vice chairman of the Joint Chiefs, uh, they didn't seem to be altogether confident that life extension and, and everything that we currently do to keep the stockpile going would work indefinitely. And they indicated, I think, pretty clearly that they, they, they see a point in the future in which we're going to have to do more. So the money is nice, but again, what it's actually spent on matters. And if the Republicans can point to something and say, we actually got a concession from the administration, they are going to allow, I mean, it won't be called reliable replacement warhead. That phraseology is toxic now. It, it can't be called that. But if they get something that looks like it that's called something else, they'll probably call it a victory and vote for the treaty, is my guess. Well, that certainly seems like a reasonable prediction. I mean, the one the one thing I think that, that I just, I find weird, and this is a something that I, you see in so many national security debates right now, is I, I constantly find myself saying, so, you know, Bob Gates, not a Democrat. You really think that if he thought the administration were compromising the need for warhead reliability, he would just quietly go along with it? No, I, no, I think, I just, I think he thinks that the fight is not lost, and that He's been trying to win an internal battle, and he's scored lots of little victories along the way, but he hasn't won the war, and he still holds out the hope that he could win the war. So, you know, I mean, I just kind of constantly want to look at the Republicans and say, you know, who do you who do you trust on the best method to get to, to meet to meet these concerns? You know, John Kyle or Bob Gates? Which, as I said, is a very is a very funny position for a progressive to find herself in. But I, I on so many of these issues, I kind of constantly and just say, just Republicans, you know, why do you hate the national security establishment so much? Me, I. I, I <laughs> Sorry, I was. I, I no. dislike some of them. Let me put it that way. Do you want to, should we start naming names? <laughs> um, on that note, I think we've passed our hour mark. Yeah. So we should before before there. we name names, we should probably wrap up for this time.